Well, good morning again, and welcome to the Episcopal Church of St. Mary the Virgin gathered virtually for worship, uh, prayer, and singing today. Uh, and we are delighted this morning that we have the Right Reverend Dr. Mark Andrus, the Bishop of California, Diocese of California, with us as presider and preacher, who will be joining us shortly. But for now, I invite you to find the bulletin for the service, either on our website, smbsf.org, or uh, if you're on Facebook, you can find it on uh, usually in the chat, uh, or if you subscribe to our highlights email, it is, the link is involved in that as well. Um, <clears throat> after a moment of silence, we'll begin with our candle lighting. If you have your candle, that was a gift uh, to those of you gathered in the name of St. Mary's, please grab it and prepare to light it or hold it if that's, you're more comfortable with that uh, for the beginning of our service. And if you don't have a candle and would like one, let us know. We light this candle as a symbol of our faith in Jesus Christ, that his presence and the wisdom of God is with us, and we are not alone. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the God of our salvation. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, We confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us all our sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. <laughs> God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we could proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of the body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of our Savior. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, St. Mary the Virgin. I am Mark Andrus, the Bishop of our diocese, the Diocese of California, uh, here at the Episcopal Church in the Bay Area. Such a, a great place to be. And uh, Sheila and I are with you uh, right here from 2006 Lyon Street, the house where we live. And um, we are grateful that we can gather as we can gather. We're grateful for the technology that makes this possible, and we're grateful for the people who have uh, brought this service, who have taken their devotion and their talent and put this all together. I'll say more about that when Father uh, David and I uh, do some greetings and announcements later, but it is so good to be able to be together as we can be together. And this is happening, as you know, across the whole Diocese of California. People are gathering. It's different in every congregation. I know you have some in-person, safely distanced, uh, outdoor morning prayers happening. I think that's beautiful. Some, uh, some congregations are only doing live streaming with um, pre-recorded everything. And it is now, as they like to say these days, asynchronous. So people watch when they watch. <laughs> uh, they, they're not gathering at a particular time. And then they're all gathering for a coffee hour. And others are all Zoom. And it's um, there's a great deal of creativity, courage, and compassion being evidenced in the Diocese of California and at St. Mary the Virgin. It is a great honor and pleasure for us, for Sheila and me, to join you. I want to uh, begin by praying with you again the prayer that is the collect for the third Sunday in Lent. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The, the person who wrote that collect for us that is knitted together with the lectionary readings for the third Sunday in Lent, which are knit together with the incredible cycle of readings and prayers that make up our lectionary, uh, a work of great uh, spiritual and intellectual genius have set the theme. Uh, seeing all these um, 
uh, lessons that are given to us today, but especially the gospel lesson from John, they have the um, person who wrote the collect has set out outwardly in our bodies, inwardly in our souls. The out idea of the outward and the inward is our theme for today. Uh, so Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, uh, a dangerous place, and this action that he takes of cleansing the temple, in the Gospel of John, it comes very early in the second chapter uh, that we hear today, and from there, it is the decisive watershed that turns some people completely against him forever, and others, it encourages and brings them to him, and it is this cleansing of the temple, uh, an outward action that is related in the dialogue that takes place between the leaders there in Jerusalem and Jesus that is related to the outward temple itself. So there's a cleansing going on, but there's also a reference to the building of the temple and to the destruction of the temple. So this idea of the outward is uh, on our minds. It's, it's a graphic and dramatic story. One of the most dramatic stories in the New Testament and has caused people a great deal of trouble. Uh, the idea of a violent Jesus, even violent for the sake of zeal for his father's house as the disciples remembered it. Uh, this is difficult for some people and we can understand that. And we'll touch on that later. But the idea of the outward actions related to the temple are also related without being so explicit to the outward cleansing, the driving out of the people who are selling the oxen and the sheep and the doves and who are also money changing to be able to purchase these things that are used for sacrifice. We see that there's a differentiation Jesus is making here. The uh, oxen and the sheep cost a lot more. Uh, they're for prosperous people to be able to purchase, and he drives those absolutely out. And he turns over the tables for the money changers. Because people like the widow, who in another gospel puts only a, all she has, a tiny coin, they don't need money changers. And their sacrifice, the doves, what they can afford, if they can afford even that, is for humble people. And Jesus doesn't let them go free. He doesn't destroy their cages and set them free and or hurt them and hurt those who owe them. He says, take them out of here. So uh, Jesus is not saying that offering sacrifice is wrong. He's not saying that uh, the devotion of people to the temple is wrong. He's saying something else. And it, it has to do, it's outward, but it has to do with the inner disposition of my soul and our souls. So uh, this is about uh, what's in my heart. St. Gregory of Nyssa, your neighbor, uh, Episcopal parish here in uh, San Francisco in the Diocese of California over in Potrero Hill, is named for a great theologian of the early church, Gregory of Nyssa. And he wrote a commentary on uh, the book of Exodus. And in it, uh, he talks about the Hebrew people who are slaves. And if you remember, uh, the Hebrew people are increasing. The fertility of, of them is a sign of God's blessing on them, even though uh, their worship of God has gone underground or even been forgotten. God is with them. God hasn't forgotten God's covenant with the Hebrew people. So they're having lots of babies, which is the sign of God's love for them. And the, the Egyptians get nervous about this. Uh, what are these great number of Hebrew slaves going to do? If they become too powerful, they'll overthrow us or there'll be trouble. So they make work harder for the Hebrew people. And one of the things they do is say, you've got to make the bricks for these incredible monuments that still are with us, the pyramids, the temples, the statues. You've got to make these bricks without straw. So they're going to be harder to make. They're going to be, um, your work is going to be so crushing and so punishing that uh, what we hope secretly is that your lives will be short and brutish. So um, 
Gregory takes this as a spiritual, this outward story about making bricks, about building temples as an inner story. It has an inner corollary, outwardly in our bodies, inwardly in our souls. And so what he says is that the mold with which we make the bricks, that, that we fill with the clay and the sand, and if we have it, the straw, that this is like the container of our heart. And there is a, um, a kind of illness of the soul that we call consumerism. It's not being a consumer, that's not an illness, it's consumerism. It's needing to fill a hole, fill the mold of my heart with things uh, that seem to satisfy our need. And may I say, I have even learned uh, way back when I was very first a bishop in Alabama 19 years ago, uh, that the image of our savior, Jesus, can be a commodity too. Uh, I heard preaching there uh, in a prominent church that every week told the people who faithfully came week after week that they were miserable sinners <laughs> and that they needed Jesus to come into their hearts. Well, I looked around and week after week, I think these people genuinely were welcoming our Savior into their hearts. They had done so and they continued to do so. And I realized that Jesus too had been, was being sold as a commodity. If Jesus is in your heart, we may need to remember that, but we don't need to replenish Jesus like we do toothpaste. The idea of consumerism is what Jesus is driving out of the temple, the outward temple, and out of the temple of our bodies, of our inward life. There is an inward life, and it is of deep importance in what eventuates in the outer world. Uh, the reflection of their inner disposition was being shown in their bringing all the oxen, the sheep, the doves, and the money changers into the temple. Now, it wouldn't be a Mark Andrews sermon if I didn't say a little bit about Greek words in the New Testament. <laughs> when this little uh, gospel story, so dramatic and so important, starts, the word for the temple, the word for the temple is a word for the whole temple complex. It's everything. Uh, from the outer porticos, as it were, of Solomon, and the area, the, um, the area where the plaza, where this money changing and the selling of sacrificial animals could take place, to the porch uh, with the great tapestry covering that is torn when Jesus dies, and into the yam, the area where, which is a, a kind of bronze sea that represents the Red Sea, and all the way into the Holy of Holies. And that Holy of Holies has a different word for it. And that's the word that the disciples apply to Jesus when he says, uh, zeal for God's house consumes him. And Jesus says, destroy this temple. And what he's saying is that Holy of Holies, the word means the part of the temple where God lives the part of the temple where God lives. That's meant to be my heart. That's meant to be the most holy part of me and of you and of us as a people. Our body is meant to have the living God at its center and not other things that will not ultimately satisfy us, no matter how beautiful they are no matter how satisfying they are, no matter how costly they are, how much we sacrifice to have them, the only thing that will last and deserves to be in the temple of our bodies at our heart is the living God. So Jesus is cleansing the outward world and telling us that we also ought to be, that the real necessity is to do the inward cleansing as well. He says this by referring to the body and the inward temple 
and the outward. So the outward is important, but the really important part is the work I need to do within the inward. So what about this violence, this, um, this driving out, making a, a, a whip of cords and violently driving it out, turning the temples over, scattering the animals. You can imagine Jesus's fury. Uh, this is the last of all the gospels to be written. And may I remind us that just what is being predicted and the way this story is being told about Jesus has already happened by the time this gospel is written and this story is told in John's words. That is, the temple in Jerusalem and Jerusalem itself have been destroyed by the Roman Empire. They are gone. And I want to make us wonder a little bit about what that would be like, the, the violence of that, by reminding ourselves what we felt when we watched the Capitol, the insurrection, moving into the Capitol building, the threats on the vice president, on the speaker of the house, on the whole of our elected officials. What did you feel at that time? What kind of uncertainty and confusion? And then 20 years before, 20 years before the destruction of the World Trade Towers in New York, everyone remembers where they were and what they were doing on that day. And the uh, crushing, unsettling, confusing, saddening experience that that was. Those two experiences, 20 years apart, put them together and think of the center of our world, the temple, the holiest of places, and this holiest city being completely obliterated by the occupying empire. So this is the uh, background and the violence that Jesus shows in, in this story reflects the violence that had been visited, the trauma that had been visited on these people. So we are here now in 2021 and I'd like to suggest that since we know that Jesus is a living, is a living God and Jesus the Christ resurrected has never left us and promises never to leave us by the spirit is still with us. So what I mean by that is that we have been moving with Jesus through these two millennia. And today we might see this work of cleansing inwardly a little differently. We might see it as something to be undertaken within you and within me and within our body of our community as something that might be done with more love and less violence. What would that look like? I haven't read the book, uh, but Marie Kondo's, Kondo's book, uh, the beautiful work of tidying up that has captivated so many people, and maybe you've cleaned your closets and, and the drawers of your dressers following her advice, that comes to mind. And what does she suggest? She, she suggests taking each item of clothing out, off of a hanger, out of the drawer, looking at it, appreciating it, asking yourself, when's the last time I wore it? Uh, how useful is it to me today? Do I need this? And if not, lovingly, with an act of gratitude, setting it aside. Another uh, way to look at this is what one great spiritual teacher says uh, about the field of my heart. If you think about the heart as a field where things grow, not just as a treasury where things are placed or as a closet, but as a place where things grow, this teacher says, and following the words of Jesus, nurture the good seeds that are in the heart and don't try to tear up the weeds. Don't try to act violently towards the weeds that I know are in me, but turn my attention to the good seeds that will flower and give good fruit. Jesus tells the parable about this. Uh, the servants of a farmer, a farm owner, see that weeds are growing among the wheat. And they say, how did this happen? And the owner says, an enemy has done this. 
planted these seeds while we were sleeping. And they say, oh, I see. Should we weed them out for you, master? And the master says, no, because if you do, you'll damage the good wheat. Let them grow together. Nurture the wheat. And God will take care of this in the harvest. So my dear Ken, Ken, the circle of my relations at St. Mary the Virgin, let us, as Lent continues, as these weeks unfold of inward searching, of the repentance that is seeking to get the good mind that we need to meet the time we are in, let us heed the words of our teacher and our brother and our savior, Jesus, and do the work of cleansing within the body of our community and the body of the temple of my heart, inward work. But let us do it with love and with reverence, with gratitude for what is there and what has been there, even for that which has caused me to suffer because it has brought me to where I am today and with nurture for that which is good within me. By so doing, we will write the disposition of our hearts so that they are prepared to really be the temple of the living God who loves us and who is always with us, but has consciously enthroned that God where God belongs in the temple of the heart. Amen. Amen. We continue with the words of the Nicene Creed, the confession of our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please join me for the prayers of the people on page eight of your worship service bulletin. O oh God, in your great compassion, look favorably upon the prayers of your people. Hear our prayers for the whole church, all leaders and ministers, and all the holy people of God, lead us in the way of love. In your goodness, renew us. Hear our prayers for the people of the world. May all leaders resist deceit, injustices, and oppression, and be lavish in their rightful judgment. We pray for our world, especially for the people of Armenia, where growing political tensions endanger their lives and livelihood. And for the children attending Nigeria's boarding schools who are susceptible to kidnapping for ransom. In your faithfulness, strengthen us. Hear our prayers for those who live in poverty and have no choice but to fast every day for the homeless, refugees and victims of violence and oppression. 
you cross the boundaries of heaven and earth to be among your people. In your righteousness, restore us. Hear our prayers for those who are hurting in mind, body, or spirit. We pray for those suffering from disease, illness, isolation, and depression, and for those who have asked for our prayers, especially for parishioners, relatives, and friends, including Donna, Gail, Larissa, Ann, Susan, and those whom we now name either aloud or silently in our hearts. In your compassion, heal us. Hear our prayers for those who have died and have entered into your abiding peace. We pray especially for the recently deceased, including Edwin E. Hahn, Teresa Kozlowski, Peter Carneiro, Sid Garrison, and for those whom we now name either aloud or silently in our hearts. Comfort those who loved and now mourn them and wipe away their every tear. In your mercy, transform us. Hear our prayers for all of us gathered together today that we all might grow closer to you during this season of Lent. Create in us a clean heart and bring forth a new springtime of faith in our lives. In your graciousness, revive us. Hear our prayers of gratitude for all the blessings of our lives. We give thanks especially for medical personnel who are the antibodies to human indifference for the life of Vernon Jordan, civil rights leader and standard bearer for racial equality, and for those other blessings which we now name either aloud or silently in our hearts. In your abiding love, awaken us. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, Help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome again to our, our worship together today. And uh, if you're near visiting, we're delighted you found your way to us on this special day. Bishop Mark, thank you so much for, for bringing your spirit, your energy, your enthusiasm, and your deep uh, awareness of God's grace uh, around us and in us uh, to your message today. I just want to thank you so much for, for being among us and invite your words to our congregation. Well, thank you, Father David. I want to start by uh, thanking this team that I can see uh, in my view, and um, all of you have seen some of. Um, Arthur, thank you for your readings and also for your lay leadership and also for your service to the diocese. Uh, it's really meaningful to me. Uh, Eric and Ellen, uh, I think uh, your music is so genius and so beautiful, and uh, I, I have benefited from many years from it, and I'm just so happy for St. Mary the Virgin that on a weekly basis, and maybe more than a weekly basis, uh, they have the pleasure and the joy of being nurtured by your, your ministry of music. And Deacon Tim Smith, uh, what, a, what a beautiful cause of justice you have brought forth uh, in your life in this later vocation of being a deacon um, after serving in many ways and as a person in a family to continue to lead in this really beautiful way. We're all being inspired to serve more humbly and more justly and uh, more truly by your leadership. And the Reverend Marguerite Judson, uh, my dear friend, who I had the pleasure of walking with towards ordination and ordaining and seeing you unfold also a new and beautiful ministry as an ordained priest in God's church. What a, what a joy to be here with you. And I only see not Natalie's um, avatar of her name. <laughs> and there she is. She had uh, un unclosed her video so I could see her. And Natalie has not only uh, been such a wonderful leader at St. Mary the Virgin, but I have uh, benefited by her leadership as a verger at the cathedral many times, and it's such a pleasure to serve with her. And then circling back around, Father David, um, we, we brought you into this di diocese not so long ago with so much joy and so much hope uh, for the leadership you bring, and I, I think it's... Um, truly what uh, has been called more and more in the last few decades, servant leadership. Uh, you seek to lead with us, and that is the most beautiful way to lead. Uh, when Jesus says he is a good shepherd uh, and says, I am the good shepherd, he means uh, to say that he walks with those he leads and is with them. Uh, the shepherd can only be affected by being with those he leads and serves. Uh, he can't defend them. He can't lead them to pasture from afar. The only way is by knowing them by name and calling them from within the heart. And it is so clear to me that this is how you lead uh, with certainly great intelligence and good humor and a good spirit, uh, but also with humility and uh, just grace. I'm so, so pleased that you're, you and Heather and your children have made their home in the Diocese of California and at St. Mary the Virgin. It's really just an honor to have you here. And to all of you who are watching from wherever you are, um, I'm so grateful. Uh, St. Mary the Virgin is a unique uh, worshiping community within the Diocese of California. You have your own spirit. Uh, I like to say that each congregation of the Episcopal Diocese of California carries the light of the Episcopal Church in its own way. So there are lots of other ways to be Christian than, than Episcopal, and there are lots of other ways to be faithful than Christian. But let us say that with our presiding bishop uh, being the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement is a very special thing. Uh, there is a particular light. And I think it's a generous light. That is, we, we meet people with generosity. Uh, it's a light of deep intelligence that is fired by the heart. Love is the most important thing in the universe, more important than all other powers of the universe. As one lay person down on the peninsula, an elder said to me, the greatest equation in the world is not E equals MC squared, but rather, 
from the letters of John, the equation, God is love. That is, God equals love. Uh, that is the most important equation in the universe, and it is at the heart of how we understand being Christian as Episcopalians, our part of the Jesus movement. Uh, so you're doing it here in Cow Hollow uh, in San Francisco in a way that no other congregation in the Diocese of California is, and you are serving your neighborhood where you are and this city in a way that nobody else is able to. You are there, you are located. And it is uh, essential for me that you are doing this. I, I believe that if any light goes out, if one congregation closes or is so damaged by um, any kind of disaster that its light is dimmed, then that is a great loss. The people around us are, are less and they are hungry. They are hurting. This is a very confusing time in the world. It's a very difficult time in the world. We see so many shuttered businesses and there are others that we don't even know have closed and people are out of work. Um, it's, it's a hard time. Uh, over 500,000 people in the United States alone have died of COVID. Uh, this is a disaster that's hard to even take in. And of course, as our governor says, and as I have said, these are, they, we have cascading disasters. Uh, I am so glad when I look out the window every morning at this beautiful Northern California weather, and there's a little part of me that goes, and that every day that's warm like this and bright and dry means we're getting ready for another fire season. So this is our reality, my dear people and you are helping your neighbors, not only yourselves, but you're helping your neighbors meet it. You're helping their real and concrete needs. And so I'm so thankful for you. And I just want to uh, say that and say thank you to you. We send you all our love. Sheila and I are so, so honored to be with you today and thank you. Bishop, you bless us and honor us with your presence and your words. And I'll just wanna give you a quick shout back. It is a deep joy not just to serve under you as your priest, but uh, as, a, as a brother in Christ. Uh, and what I so appreciate about you is not only your vision of God's grace to us, but to the, to the people beyond us, through us, and to the entire world, to, to the, all of creation, which mm -hmm. indeed is the, you know, it encapsulates us all. Uh, and so I just, I appreciate your vision to us, the grander vision beyond us, and your invitation for us to partner with that. So thank, thank you, you, Father David. My bishop, I really am honored to be serving with you at this, as you described so, so beautifully at St. Mary's Church. So thank you. And with that, we'll continue our service. Please, all, all of you out there, you'll find the link to Coffee Hour in, on the website. Uh, please join us to spend some time with the bishop continuing after the service and an additional link. Uh, and see you next week. Blessings. And I will take myself off screen. <laughs> Let's, let us pray the general Thanksgiving so you can join me wherever you are. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and together we have dwelled upon your word. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us bow our heads before God. Look with compassion, O Holy One, upon us, your people, that rightly observing this holy season, we may learn to know you more fully and to serve you with a more perfect will. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Comfort the afflicted. Be patient with everyone, but make no peace with oppression. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the source of all being, the incarnate word, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. To God.